for downloading the new Paltrowcast with Darren Paltrowitz. This episode is different than all the others because I had been working well in advance on all the prior episodes. So this is actually the first episode that I'm putting together after the coronavirus pandemic. And my thoughts are with you and your family. Hope everybody is fine around you. Hope life is okay and all that. Some people I know, it's business as usual. Other people, it's not. So really just thoughts and prayers and optimism and all that. So now on to the entertainment. I spoke with three different people, three different career trajectories, three people that I respect immensely who I've been a longtime admirer of. And those are Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick, Jim Ross, a.k.a. good old JR, and Jim Ward from the band Sparta. First up is my interview with Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. I had the pleasure of speaking with Rick on the heels of the Nielsen Trust tour. The Nielsen Trust is a collective of people from his family, including his son, Dax, who's the drummer in Cheap Trick. They just, for fun, in his off time from touring with Cheap Trick, which was one of the last bands I saw before this whole quarantine happened, they decided to do a month-long tour give or take a week or two, of small clubs, just hanging out as a family, playing some music in intimate spaces, sort of a QA and a and all that. The tour ultimately got postponed after it kicked off. I believe they're trying to reschedule these dates for Cheap Trick off time in general, but a pleasure to speak with Rick. We spoke a little bit about Cheap Trick, who I had seen earlier in the week, and I never miss when they come to Long Island. Sounds like they have new music in the works, And you're going to hear Rick being Rick, which is always a great thing by me. Thank you very much for calling right on time. Good day for you so far? Oh, yeah. I want to ask you a bunch of things about the Trust Tour. Who came up with the idea for the tour? Well, Cheap Trust is usually working. So we talked about doing this a long time ago. And and, um, Robin's going to be in Germany with, uh, with Alice Cooper doing a bunch of shows for about a month. So I said, hey... This is going to be an opportunity to finally do it. And uh, so we did a warm-up show. We, we did, did about three or four songs at a Miles Nielsen show. And um, now, we've got, now we've got 13 shows coming up. Right. So those shows start next month. What does the set list look like? Are you allowed to say? It's not written yet. So, you know, between, between Miles and Kelly and Dax and myself, and we've got so many songs to choose from, and and we, you know, it doesn't mean we, we you know, we could do cover songs. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> Would there be more and, of an emphasis know, on deep cuts? It could be, it could be, or you know, like I said, we have it'll probably be different every night anyhow. It's going to because I want to have a Q and A, Q&A, uh, and I'm going to try to get a bunch of different things that we've got planned. And, you know, like I said, it's, it's not like it's something's written in stone here. So we're, we're kind of playing it by ear. And if this tour goes well, might there be an album from the Nielsen Trust? Oh, it could be. Yeah, it could be anything. We could, be, we could write new stuff, too. Uh, you know, between all, like I said, between all, everybody that's in there, there's enough song power. And, you know, who are we influenced by? And who would, what songs have we never done before? I guess it, maybe even take a request too. So, you know, it's like I think the Elvis Costello years ago did the spin the song list. You know, where the people can choose what they want. You know, some of the stuff in advance, maybe off off the cuff. And rather than being up there preaching to people, telling them what they should hear, we want to find out what uh, what others want to hear. It's pretty amazing your output the past few years. I think you're at five albums in four years. 
And plus, you just said that there's a possibility that Nielsen Trust could eventually turn into an album. It seems like you're writing every day or every week. Is that the case? Well, yeah, it seems like it. But uh, besides, we play so much. You know, like, I'm in New York tonight. We're, tonight we're playing in um, to some someplace outside of New York. Two, two days ago, we were in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, tomorrow we're uh, tonight we're playing. Like I said, near here, and then the next day we're playing. I don't have the list in front of me, and then the next day after that, we're in Washington, D.C., and then the next day after that, then we fly to Puerto Rico, and we're, and we're there for uh, two days, and then we get back, and then uh, then actually, then I then we go to San Diego. She tricks a private show up there, and then, uh, then we have a couple days of rehearsal, and before you know it, it's uh, showtime up in Wisconsin. We had two shows starting off with two shows up in uh, uh, Wisconsin Dells, a place where Robin had, uh, he usually goes up there with his family and plays. Well, I had the pleasure of seeing you two nights ago at Westbury. I never miss a cheap trick show when it's in New York City or Long Island. And it always amazes me mm. that after the first or second song, you really don't know what you're going to get. It's going to be a mix of interesting deep cuts and covers. And I think you have 18 studio albums at this point, besides all the B-sides and rarities and soundtracks. What is the process like in choosing a set list every night? Is everyone like sitting around the bus and talking about which songs to do? There's some of the stuff that we're going to be doing for sure. And then uh, we, we like to swap it around. See, what, have, what haven't we done in a while? Oh, this one would be good. Oh, that song is cool. Oh, you know, if we have a sound check, and we'll, you know, like the other day. So what did you, what did you hear that you liked the other day? I enjoyed hearing How Are You. Uh, I wish I could hear Stiff Competition, but hey, it was a great set list. If you looked, if you looked at our, followed our uh, set list from a few nights ago, we played it, uh, I don't know, three or four nights ago. Stiff Competition, we did that. And I don't remember which ones we played. Oh, we played, oh, I don't know, that was uh, How About You. Da, 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 exactly, the second song that you did at Westbury. And yeah, you, usually next position, please, isn't too represented in the set lists. That's a lot of people's favorite albums. The singer songwriter, Tim Christensen, that's his favorite Cheap Trick album, believe it or not. You know, having as many records as we do, you know, we could play all night and never repeat a song, obviously. And, well, you and, have to write a set list for next time or a re request list. I mean, the other night we had a guy that uh, from Madison Square Garden, I remember that. He was right in the front row, right in front of us. And to my right was uh, John Barbados, you know, the clothing designer. He came to see us, and he'd never seen this this and that song. So it's uh, it's always kind of interesting. And we had Rob Bartlett. I was I couldn't find him in the audience. He was sitting right in the uh, corner. If you know who he is, yeah, from the Ima show, he's Ira, a couple of rows ahead. Rob Bartlett, yeah, from Ima, and uh, Ira Robbins from Trouser Press. He was there. You know, like those are just the people I know. Well, going back to what you were saying about albums and all that, on the Silver album, you talked about the album The Doctor being a bit underrated. Are there any other albums in the years since that you think are underrated and more Cheap Trick fans should dig into? Uh, yeah, all of them. No, I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't understand around think about it. So. Can I ask you a couple of questions about Rockford? Because I was in the city a couple of months ago on a press trip. The city had flown me in. Yeah, one of the questions. Okay, so is it true that you're involved with the Hard Rock Hotel that's being built? Uh-huh. Yeah, I've been working on that for about 12 years. I had to, I went down to Springfield and, and tried to per persuade the, to let the state know that, you know, it's like, we, we, personally, I don't need a job, but, you know, it's like the, a lot of people where I live that do. And uh, uh, to have some, some uh, company as big as the Hard Rock was willing to wanted to come there. You know, of course, I was, I hope to be a, a good spokesman for it. And it and looks it like uh, that's going to be the first hotel in the downtown area or the only one at the moment? It's not in the downtown. It's on the edge of town. Got it. And speaking of the downtown area, I saw in the Coronado, you have your own chair. What was the process of getting yeah. your own chair at a big theater like that? Well, I helped raise the money to, to, to reha rehab that place. I think we raised about... 17 or 18 million dollars a number of years ago and i said well I, being that it's uh, on the national register uh you know you couldn't you couldn't actually install something like that and, and i said but you know for my work 
of helping organize all that stuff. I said, uh, Rick, we'd, we'd like to have have something for you. Would you like a you know front row seat or something? I said, Heck no, I want to sit where uh, I'd like to. If I'm going to get something, I'd like to have one up where I used to sit up next to the last row up on the balcony. And so they have a it's it's a regular it's a seat, but I I, I had to make a a checkerboard seat that uh, it it go it fits over it. We had to lock it because somebody tried to steal it. So, um, that's that's where I wanted something. So that was my thank you for helping rehab the thing. Absolutely, an eye-catching seat that you could see from the stage, <laughs> for sure. Uh, how up are you yeah. on the latest and greatest things in Rockford? Because the Urban Forest Craft Brewery is in the process of opening. Fire Department Coffee is growing. Pig's Mine is growing. 15th and Chris is getting cool. When you're back in town, do you check out places like this, or do you just kind of stop? Yeah, I've been, to, been to 15th and Chris a bunch of times. I helped. I don't want to have a big article about me, but it's like, you know, I've... I've uh, promoted the stuff in town for years. And there's a lot of stuff. Uh, the, the Nielsen Corral is uh, is the vocal thing that my father started uh, from the Mendelssohn Club, which he helped years ago. And so now that's been renamed to Nielsen Corral. It's, it's not like a cowboy corral, you know. One more cheap trick question, then I'll bring it back to the Nielsen Trust. And I saw the recent interview that you did with Dan Rather and the ending question oh, yeah. that he asked, and it was a great interview, the ending question that he asked when he said, what is the cheapest trick you've ever pulled? Did you groan a little bit on the inside when he asked that? Uh, well, you know, when it's, when it's the whole band talking, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of competition because he doesn't direct all the questions to me. And so uh, I think I was the, the worst one on there. But so the, but, uh, uh, Rob was really good. Uh, Tom was funny, and and Dan, he was like, he was terrific. I thought, you know, the fact that he wanted to do it, yeah. It was definitely was, a great was, interview, though. Yeah, it was fun. And back to the Nielsen Trust. Oh, what was that secret? I, so I I made my own tape. I said, hey, Dan, how'd you like to hear my, my Rick Nielsen solo record? And he just smiled at me. I said, well, good, because I, I haven't made it. Yeah, or I haven't made one yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, if there were a Nielsen Trust record, would you be writing the songs with your kids, or would you be taking the lead there too? Well, maybe they'd be writing with me, not 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 me with them. I don't know. Yeah, you know, we haven't we haven't discussed any of that. We talked about it, but you know, everybody's schedule is so hectic. Our road manager, tour manager, says you should be you should take it easy on that month. I said, oh yeah, right. <laughs> That ain't going to happen. And that kind of begs the point. This is your off time. And being that you're doing an album every year, every nine months even, are there any hobbies for you outside of music? Or is really music, when you're not doing that, you're doing more music? Well, guitar collecting. You know, I, I helped start the, the Meekum Domino Guitar Search uh, that's, that's going on right now. And I was, was just down in uh, Kissimmee, Florida. We had 3,500 cars and 250 guitars and uh, i'm going to be involved in the next couple of them too so it's, uh, it's a, a lot of things going on I, mean, I don't like talking about myself believe it or not but you know it's like, i can't believe i'm involved in so many things and like i said i don't even need another job so being like respectful this, like this interview <laughs> this is interviews cutting into my goofing off time <laughs> right so being respectful of your time uh, any last words for the kids rick uh, yeah, stay healthy and uh, come to the show and like, everybody can pick on me because I don't, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Well, looking forward I'm to your Jones. Child, so I, I'm an only I'm surprised anybody talks to me. Well, looking forward to your Jones Beat show in a couple of months. Hope there is a new album coming out in June and hope to get the Nielsen Trust onto the East Coast. That'd be, that'd be fun. Yeah, you're, you're my first interview I've ever done, so I'm, I don't have any down pat qu quiz or or interview questions or answers prepared. It's all off the top of my head. And so it doesn't sound like I got much on my head. Outro cast. Next up is my interview with Jim Ward from the band Sparta. Before Sparta took off, Jim was one of the founding members of At The Drive-In, which is an incredibly influential band to say the least. And At The Drive-In's breakup and peak and all that were about 20 years ago. Sparta's done multiple albums. It's really great to see them back. 
In between at the drive-in and Sparta's reunion right here, Jim has also been a part of Sleeper Car. He's had solo material. He's never stopped creating, and we spoke a bit about that, why he still calls El Paso, Texas home, and what he has coming up in general. Really, really nice guy. I had never spoken with him before, and really I do hope to speak with him again in the near future. Hi, it's Darren for your interview. Still a good time? Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, really appreciate the time that you're taking here, and it's great to see that Sparta is back. How long was it from deciding that the band was coming back to actually announcing the single and the album? So Matt and I talked like in two, early 2018 or middle, middle 2017, maybe, um, and just decided we wanted to play some shows. And that kind of started from there. So we decided we'd just take it as it comes, you know? So we, we book, we played one show in El Paso. That was pretty fun. So then we played about three shows in Texas and that was pretty fun. So we just started, you know, going with it, seeing where it went. We toured in 2018 and then kind of spent 2019, uh, making a record. So it, it was kind of, I guess, kind of a long journey a little bit, maybe two and a half years from sort of the decision to want to do it to, you know, next week when the record comes out. Right. So trust the river is out next week and that's great. Everyone was kind of looking forward to Sparta coming back, but is this a permanent thing or is it really just a one record at a time kind of regrouping? I'm pretty adamant about just going with the flow. That's why I don't really, myself, I don't, I don't tend to end things permanently. I don't break up bands or, or whatever. I just sort of go with the flow, right? So I trust the river. That's what it's about. Sort of taking life as it comes and enjoying it, not really knowing where it's going to go. So yeah, I kind of, the way I see it is that we, we're current, I mean, obviously the world is weird right now and we don't exactly know what's going to happen, but we'll announce sort of the the dates that got messed up because of this, we'll announce those and then we'll just kind of go and see, see what happens. Now you just mentioned that you don't break up bands. Is sleeper car still on? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the, the thing is most of these are, have now sort of evolved into to more collectives than bands. I mean, Sparta, Matt has to be there for it to be Sparta. So he's the only person that, that I call and say, can we do this as Sparta? And he says, yes or no. So there's really only two people in the quote unquote band. Uh, the rest of the people that come and go and play, it's it's more of a collective, and and it's kind of based on sleeper car, which is just me and whoever wants to play, when I have the desire to do it, when they have the desire to do it. So, um, I would expect sleeper car at some point. I'd expect more solo stuff. I would expect kind of like whatever happens, maybe a new band. I don't know. So people who look at your discography, they see that there's a new album every two years depending on what name it's under, of course. Have you been a full-time musician all these years? No, no. Actually, I, I sort of left the road like full-time in, in 2000, at the end of 2008, at the end of the Sparta record for the threes, for the tour for threes. I was just burned out, honestly, and I had been doing sort of write, record, tour cycle for so long um, that I really, you know, like I had a, a home, I have a family in El Paso, and I just hadn't really been around much. Um, so I started just doing other things. I opened a bar, and then I opened a studio, and then I opened a venue, and then I opened a restaurant, and then the venue, you know, like things come and go. Um, but I've been able to be creative and sort of at least pay my bills. Um, just being here and doing stuff kind of in a little bit more relaxed or you know, like when you're when you're a full-time band, that's a lot of people that depend on that that paycheck every month, crew and band members and everybody has families and you sort of ha- get into this repetition because you have to and it it to me it just kind of took the the spontaneity and the fun out of uh kind of making music and it turned into this sort of like grind that I didn't enjoy anymore. So since then, uh I've put out a few records, played a few shows, um it's kind of weird to think that it's been 14 years since um, a record came out with the name Sparta, but to me, it right. seems like a natural progression. So I don't have any, you know, feels totally normal to me. I don't know how else to see it. Well, again, great to see that you're back doing Sparta stuff, but also Sleeper Car and also Jim Ward stuff. So yeah, yeah. you mentioned El Paso, and as somebody yeah, yeah. who's toured the world many times over, besides family, what is it that keeps you in El Paso? So part of it, I think, is when I was, and, and I tell this to kids here a lot, like, don't be afraid to go off and go to school and explore the world. Um, 
and also don't be afraid to come home. This is a, it's a pretty great place. It's, it's not the best place to grow up in if you're looking for adventure. Like we're pretty isolated, especially when I grew up, there wasn't an internet necessarily. We were still mail ordering records. Um, and I was, I was chomping at the bit to get out. So when I was 18, I, I went on tour and kind of never looked back. Um, but I, but I always came home. Um, and then I, I met a girl that I fell in love with and, uh, when everybody else moved to California, she couldn't because, or, I mean, we couldn't afford out of state tuition. She was in college. Um, so I just stayed here and it ended up being kind of a lucky, a lucky thing. I mean, we've been, we're still together. It's 23 years, but part of that being here is that I got to appreciate growing up sort of in my twenties and thirties in, in the city. And I came to appreciate it on a whole different level. Um, it's a unique place. It's a, it's a border town, which I think most people know. Um, but it has sort of like a, a port mentality because we're on the border. There's a lot of trade. Um, it's a little bit crazy and it's still isolated. It's still West Texas. We're very independent thinkers. Um, I think it's hard to sort of put our community into a box and that's sort of what I love about it. And it's, it's, you know, like a port town, it, it has a lot of people coming and going and planting roots and up, upending their roots and moving on. And, and I, I sort of love that energy. Does it have direct flights everywhere needed? You know, we have direct flights to LA and, and Dallas and Austin. And I mean, we're still combined with El Paso and, and Wada is, is over two, two and a half million people. So it's a pretty huge place. Geographically, it's a big place. Um, I've never had, you know, the whole thing we used to joke, like if we were coming from Australia or Japan and we would land at LAX, um, I would pretty much land, go through customs, get on a plane, be home about the same time some of the other guys were getting to their house just based on LA traffic, right? So I'm an hour and 20 minutes from LA by plane. It's super easy. I live 12 minutes from the airport in El Paso. <laughs> it's like, it's not, it's not bad at all. Well, when this all blows over, that sounds like one of the cities I have to go to next as a travel writer. So I appreciate that tip. And not to dwell too much on the past here, but one of the things that intrigues me most is you are in arguably the last big band on the Grand Royal Record Company. And Grand Royal is <laughs> kind of like this, this fabled story record company where the artists were running the ship and they were only putting out the cool stuff that they liked. Now, putting aside any royalty stuff or whatever, was being on Grand Royal as cool as it seemed like it would be? The, the short answer is yes. Um, the longer answer is that I had a, at a pretty young age, I had an opportunity to make a record with a budget bigger than I had ever imagined. Uh, it wasn't huge compared to other offers that we had, but it was the coolest, definitely the coolest place to go. Um, and at the end of the day, I was going and, and talking and discussing things with Mike D from the Beastie Boys. Like, I don't think it gets cooler than that when you're like 22 years old. Right. So yeah, it was, it was great. It was a, uh, it was an unreal experience and an awesome part of my life. And, and I will forever be grateful for that. That record changed a lot of lives, uh, mine included. And then bringing it back to now with Sparta, uh, you said that you've learned to take everything one tour at a time, one album at a time, etc. But being that you've been in major label bands on and off for weirdly over two decades now, yeah. uh, is there anything that you still hope to accomplish by playing music that you haven't yet? I think that I'm on the, the hunt for great songs. Everything else is secondary or further down the list. Like fame, fortune has never interested me. I don't care at all about that stuff. I don't care about awards. Um, I wouldn't go to award shows if I was invited. I don't care about um, gold records. You know, somebody gave me a gold record. I, I don't want it in my house. You know what I mean? It's just not my thing. I'm after the, the song. Like, I, that's all I care about. Um, second to that is, is going on tour because I, I do like playing music in front of people. There's some part of that that, that affects your ego and your self-confidence and it's fun and it's social and I enjoy that stuff. Um, but part of going on tour is that you get to make more records. And that's really what I'm concerned with is, is writing songs and sort of chasing, chasing that. So the only thing that I want to do in my lifetime is, is keep exploring songwriting. It's something that's been coming out of me, honestly, pretty much 
continuously since I was 11 or 12 years old when I picked up an instrument and started inventing on it and not learning other people's songs. I can't really play anybody else's songs. I only know how to, sometimes I don't even know how to play my songs. What I really like to do is sit down and just make, is just create. So no covers albums coming from you anytime soon, I guess. Maybe. I mean, I like doing it. I've, I've been trying to do it more partially just to learn. Um, you know, it's fun to explore other people's way of writing. I just, it's never been like a priority to me. I think a covers album would be fun if you could reinvent the songs. I don't think I could ever do a straight, you know, cover record that, that was not really altering the songs, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Well, a good reference point to that would be the drummer System of a Down's new album is a covers album where he reinvented the song. So just a little reference point there. So in closing, uh, Jim, any last words for the kids? Oh, no. Just, you know, everybody stay safe. Take care of each other. I think we're going to get to really see some some shining examples of humanity coming up. And I hope that, that we all just take care of each other the best we can. Thank you so much for your time. Fan for what now? 20 years. Saw you in Warsaw (laughs) with Sparta with the detachment kit. So keep doing the great stuff that you're doing and uh, hope this is a sign of more to come. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for your time. If you do come down to El Paso, let me know. This is my number. So send me a text and I'll I'll send you in the right direction. Last but definitely not least is my interview with Jim Ross. Good old JR. Yes, that Jim Ross. Jim Ross has been working in and around professional wrestling for over 40 years. He has been the lead commentator for WWE and other companies. Currently, he's working for AEW All Elite Wrestling. He's not only the lead announcer on air, he's also the senior advisor to the company. When you think about wrestling, you have to think about Jim Ross because he signed The Rock, John Cena, Batista, Brock Lesnar, all these people who've become household names and often popped up in other media. He's the guy who signed them. He's the guy who dealt with them, got their contracts going and all of that. But there's so much more to Jim Ross than wrestling and commentating for sports. He has a weekly podcast that's really successful. He has his own line of barbecue sauces and seasonings. Uh, That had led him to having his own restaurant a decade or so ago. But Jim's second book is called Under the Black Hat. It recounts why he left WWE, or rather the events that led him to leave WWE and get up to where he is now. Now, I had the pleasure of interviewing Jim a couple of years ago in Norman, Oklahoma. I was there in Oklahoma City for a press trip and got in touch with Jim, and they basically said, if you can get out to Norman, you can speak with Jim. So I took an Uber from Oklahoma City to Norman. Didn't know if I was going to be with him for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, no idea. Wound up with him for three hours and really had a blast. It wasn't a great time in his life because he had lost his wife, Jan, not too long before that. But reading the book, speaking with him now, you just hear a guy that's full of gratitude, that's doing much better, and is making the world a better place. He's imparting wisdom, to say the very least. So... I look at this interview as not just him talking about his new book, but him teaching about gratitude and how he's become the man he is today. So I think you're going to enjoy this little change of pace here. How are you feeling today, by the way? Are you holed up there at uh, home? Yeah, I'm in Oklahoma. I'm not traveling. Got it. Is it a mandatory quarantine out there or is it a suggested situation? Not mandatory. You go to the grocery store, that kind of deal essential things but other than that uh you know stay home bringing it over to your book here it's an absolute page turner it's a quick read i don't think anyone can say otherwise and please take that as a compliment and when i spoke with you last about two years ago you were in an interesting position where you were working for multiple companies you were looking at different proposals and all that and the epilogue of the book kind of brings you up to speed on where you're at now when uh-huh. did you know that you were going to AEW? What month or year did that actually start to come about? Golly, let me see. This is 2020. We, we opened the doors in October of 19. It was long before. It was long. It was before that. I'm just. I'm going to guess uh, uh, the end of uh, somewhere in 2018. We talked. I met Tony. Here's the deal. I met Tony. As you, I think I saw him. I read the book. Tony, Alex Marvez introduced Tony to me in Long Beach, California during the 
New Japan Access TV Doubleheader Weekend. And uh, at that t- at that time, uh, you know, uh, I realized Tony was an extremely intelligent. That he was uh, amazing, had amazing recall uh, for pro wrestling. And, you know, he was quoting things I said and I did and all this stuff. So you knew that he was more than just a casual fan. Sure. Uh, and so we talked about, you know, I gave him some names, some people that I thought would be good if he ever started a rest. He, we, start, we started talking about a wrestling company. And I didn't, at that time, you know, look, I've talked to a lot of guys over my career about they're going to start a wrestling company, want me to be a part of it, blah, blah, blah. And, and it, I don't know that any of them, I don't think any of them ever materialized. Uh, but nonetheless, they also didn't have the financial backing that he's got. So that was a nice thing. So we talked about the, the, the business in general. So I guess in the late 2000, somewhere in that Long Beach area, whatever that, whenever the hell that was, was when I started, uh, uh, thinking more about this Tony Khan guy. Is he going to be able to do what he says he wants to do? And then, uh, in January, Maybe later, maybe December of 19, we started having more serious conversations with Tony and my agent, Barry Bloom, who also represents Jericho and Kenny Omega uh, there. So uh, Barry had skin in the game in that regard. So Barry negotiated a deal uh, for me, three-year deal, around the first of 2019. And then... Uh, when my contract ended at the end of March of 2019, before it, it, my contract ended before WrestleMania, because Vince and I had spoken, he said, "Well, I really, you're going to be leaving. I don't want you to leave, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I, I really wanted you to work WrestleMania, but he never mentioned it to me. My con- I said, "Well, your contract, your the people that did your last contract should have been more, should have been smarter." <laughs> they said my contract in after WrestleMania. I said before, you never do that. And he, 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 he agreed. Uh, I said, well, I'll just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll give my word. You know, you're, you're not using me and I can make more money and be used. It's a win-win Vince. I'm back on the road. I'm back working. I got something to do. I got a destination. I can build my self-esteem back up. I lost the greatest thing in my life and my wife, Jan. So why not? And he, he still wanted me to stay and, and, uh, you know, but nonetheless, that's kind of where that happened. But the day after my contract ended, uh, I signed a con, I signed my deal when my contract in WWE in 24 hours, I had a new contract signed, sealed and delivered. And it was on the payroll for AEW and no regrets. Best move I've made since cut the next, it's the best move I've made in my career since, signing with Vance in 93. People who read the book closely will see that you don't hide from any of the facts, yet you always kind of take the high road in complimenting people. In other words, you're able to talk about negative situations, but in a positive light. Have you always been that way? I haven't. Big problem, Darren. Big problem. I have not always taken the high road. I, I, I've been uh, combative. Uh, I've been attitudinal over the years. And I learned that from my father. Uh, who was that way, big time, uh, and Vince, uh, guys like Ole Anderson, and of course the great Cowboy Bill Watts was not, uh, you know, didn't give you that peaceful, easy feeling. I was still learning from my favorite band. Uh, but yeah, I, I no, I wasn't always that way, because it was a self-defense mechanism. That's all it was, a self-defense mechanism. And... Uh, it, it allowed me to cover up my insecurities a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I, this book is totally honest, totally honest. And I didn't want to come off as a poor me. Oh, Jr. lost his wife and he's, he's 68. He's living alone. Poor Jr. You know, wrong, 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 wrong. Uh, I learned through, uh, gunfires and theoretically that I had to change the way I looked at a lot of things. And I did. And, and unfortunately my wife's untimely death made that happen. It made me stop and think you're, you're, you're not going to change history. If you 
continue to do the same things? How can you continue to do the same things in your life and expect to be a change? You can't. It's not going to happen. So all the things that happen to me, whether it be illness, uh, job issues, philosophical issues at work with the most powerful man in the history of, the, of my genre, uh, and then, of course, losing my wife, there's still got to be a way to come out on the other side and where you could actually see the sunshine. It took me a long time to see the sunshine. But I, but that was that was what I did. I, I, I tell people that I don't have any room in my carry-on for any more negatives. There's no room. And a lot of my buddies that uh, I, I that I used to see on a regular basis, generally at the bar for happy hour, I don't see them as much anymore. Instead of going two or three days a week, I might go one or two days a month. But that was important for me to, to separate from and, and, and gravitate to more positive people or more positive entities. So that's kind of where I'm, that's where I was with that deal, man. I, I had to change there and I had to change. And I I almost let myself get too far. And I know that if I had not changed and I had not gotten healthier with my self-medicating and some of that crap, uh, that I probably would be dead by now. Uh, and she and I always talked that I would be the first to go because I was a former smoker and I was overweight and I was this and that and I was older. So, uh, you know, that was kind of where that was, man. I just, uh, I had, I had to change and I, but I was always, I was concerned. Is it possible for me to change? Can I, at this stage of my life, can we 60 plus year old people change? Can old dogs really learn new tricks? Am I, you know, am I so set in my ways that I'm not willing to change? So the first thing about getting your life better especially in today's crazy times is be willing to change and, and be willing to compromise, be willing to change what you do for the better. So that's kind of what I've done, man. I've just, I've tried to, and the Tony Khan, uh, uh, friendship and him hiring me was a blessing. Cause I, I don't know that I could have done another year like 2018. I, I was losing. I just, I had no, I was indifferent to so many things, including my own health, including me. And, and so I don't know. I, I had to change, and and I and I and I, bought, I fought, and I worked through it, and I thought about it. You know, I, I prayed occasionally. Uh, you know, I'm not a real religious guy. I believe in a higher power, but I'm not going to. You know, I'm not going to travel that road. Uh, but I, I had to. I had to do new things there and I had, I had to get, I had to get new motivation and new foundation. I had to rebuild the foundation of my life. And that's what we can all do. It's not impossible. We can't do a damn thing about the hands we're dealt by and large, not a damn thing. But what we can do is how do we react to those hands that are dealt? I'm not, you know, I, I, I just, sometimes you got to throw a couple of cards in and, and draw a couple, you know what I mean? You got to try to improve your hands. That's what I try to do. I try to improve my hand, but, and, and that's, and that's what I've done. You know, now, right now, I can tell you this right now, I'm alone in my house. I'm not going anywhere. I, I may go to the grocery store today and buy some orange juice and some milk and some bread. Big deal, right? Exciting day for JR. Right. That'll be my day. And, but now I have, I'm healthy. I'm happy. I'm, I'm sober. I'm clean. Uh, I feel good. I'm blessed to be where I am in my life. My grandchildren are healthy. My daughters are healthy. I think I'm healthy as far as I know. So, you know, I don't have any, I don't have anything to bitch about other than we could all change our, our course if we choose to focus on it. But many people give up. Then they try to refocus and, and, and move on and they stumble and so that, well, I knew it wasn't going to work. You can't quit that way. You can't do that. You got to continue to try to do good and to do better and, and to do happy, be happy. So that's kind of where I am with that deal. It's not a motivational book, but maybe in a way it is. I think this book's kind of a love story too, talking about Jan and me. Uh, when I, the hardest thing I've ever done so far, Darren, is read the audio book. And that audio book is going to be, it's going to be a classic. I really believe. I think people are going to love that because. I didn't do it in a reads. I did it in a presentation standpoint. 
so I read the book, but I read the book and the voices and the tone and inflection of those that Ooh. are uh, I was talking about. So it's a different read than just having a, you know, the big voice guy come in and do your read for you. It's a, it's a little bit more of a presentation. So I think that people are going to be very pleasantly surprised at that. But I'm glad you got to read it already. How did you get the book? Through Simon Schuster? Sam made sure that Marlena sent it to me, and it came overnighted, and I really read it in about six, seven hours. It was such a quick read. Cool. Good. It's good to hear. Something that you just said, a phrase, really just piqued my interest, and that's that you said you had no room in your suitcase for any of that drama. And when I look at what I know that you've got going on, so you're the voice of AEW on weekly television beyond pay-per-views and special events and all that. You've got this podcast with Conrad, which is huge. You've done two books in the last five years that are for a major publisher. The Barbecue Sauce line and Condiments and all that, which my wife and I regularly use at home. We love it. That's doing well. You also pop up from time to time announcing for other companies. When you've got this kind of productivity going on, how do you get it done? Do you have an assistant? Do you delegate things? Oh, man, a uh, good team, good people around you. Uh, I gravitated to Simon & Schuster because that's such an outstanding team and a great track record. Uh, I Sometimes you, you, you take steps forward by eliminating things that are pre-existing. So uh, you know, one of the buzzwords you hear now a lot is the pre-existing conditions and pre, you know, that, that type deal. Well, my pre-existing condition was hanging around some people that probably were didn't, that I shouldn't have been doing that didn't have the motivation to drive the positivity uh, to do uh, to do their life in a more positive presentation. I, 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 I'm pretty anal. I'm pretty organized. Uh, there's guys, Sam Ford at uh, Simon Schuster has been a big, bon- big benefit. My number one guy that helps me at AEW and uh, with my appearances and all those things is Raphael Morphy, M-O-R-F-F-I. Raphael Morphy. He's a New York City guy. Uh, he's a former worker, not a worker, but you know, a, a peer. Sure. It does, it, he was a he was one of the, their top market reps for over a decade. So we got to know each other very, very well. So, uh, you know, he's he helped me. He's produced a lot of my shows, my stage shows, my signings. Uh, Raphael helps me immensely, uh, and so you can't do it on your own. But you're it's up to you to have a good team a good team and, uh, and that, a, a, a positive people, not a slackers, not a bottom feeders or ham and eggers, as Eno would say, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the team. So I got a, I got a small team. You know, I, I did the same thing in my, in my personal life. I, I hired a brand new accountant, a new accountant, a new, uh, uh, accounting firm. Uh, I hired, uh, uh, who else I got? I hired some other. Oh, I hired a new. Uh, I hired guy, a, a couple guys to, work, to help me here at home. Yard, pool, all that outdoor stuff, landscaping. I, I hired a, a, a handyman that could, I could use when I needed to have something done. He was here today. I could get my ceiling fan to turn on. He came over and did it in about thirty seconds. It made me really feel insignificant. <laughs> so, sure. Uh, I got so I got guys, that are, and they're all my friends. They're all people I like to be around. And so, therefore, I, when I see them coming, I'm happy. And when we talk about a project, it's in positivity. So everything I have been able to change, I have done so. Everything of negative of negative uh, persuasion, Darren. So that's kind of how I've done that. But I've got a little team around me that are my guys. And, uh, you know, i got a, I never had a housekeeper before. I've had a housekeeper now for a couple of years. She comes in once a week. So I've got my little crew around me. My, you know, I'm the, I'm the booker of my own little world. <laughs> You're running the territory. Yeah, running my own little territory. We don't make, we're not away from home too much, but the shows are good local. They're local shows. Travel's doable. I go out in my backyard, and, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? I'm just being facetious. But it's a, you, you change your people, man. You change, you change, uh, you change, you change. The players, if you if your locker room is not healthy, you get you, you work on that deal type thing. So, I don't know. Uh, I I am busy. The work with Conrad's been another blessing. Between Tony Khan and Conrad Thompson, uh, 
I got a renewed spirit as it relates to pro wrestling. And so I, I owe those guys. I owe them my best work. I owe them my loyalty. I owe them my professionalism. I owe them my positivity. And I think that's what we're getting. Uh, uh, we're, 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 that's where we are. So that's helped me a lot, uh, Darren, on that deal. Just how I approach things. I used to be the kind of guy that if a problem came across my radar, I felt hell bent to solve it. All the while now realizing, now I realize that some of these problems that come across our, our individual radars are, we cannot solve. They're not our issues to solve. We don't have the ability to solve them. Those of you like right now getting frustrated with this crazy virus. Well, it's kind of for, it's kind of in vain, isn't it? We don't even know what the future holds. So why are we going to get excited in a negative way, negativity, negativity uh, on uh, this matter when we know we can't take care of it? We can't solve it. But a lot of people in our, in our world, in our life, are very, uh, they have no issues about being that person that's going to solve all the world's problems. I, I realize I can't do that. And I, I stopped trying. Now, do I have empathy? Do I, do I, am I interested? Do I, do I want to help the common cause? Do I want to help people? Absolutely. But I got to realize I can't feed every kid in the world. I can feed my share. I can do, I can help. I can't, I can't fund the cauliflower alley club that helps the old, you know, wrestlers that are in need. Right. But I can contribute to them. I can be a member. I can be, I can donate money and things of that nature, do my share. So I've done a lot more of that. You know, there's, a lot of the wrestlers are down their luck. I, I contribute to a lot of GoFundMe's and things like that. It makes it feel better. It makes it feel good. I hope they appreciate it. Sometimes they actually even say thank you. More often than not, they don't. It's almost like they're in, they're entitled. I'm just a friend. I'm somebody in the business. I want to help you. And I don't. I'm not looking for your thank you. I just want to help you. And how it goes from there is up to you. Well, uh, do you have time for two more quick questions, or are you pressed for time? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, great. The first thing I want to know is an old saying that you've relayed a lot over the years is that if you make it out of the wrestling business with friends to fill up five fingers, you know, it, is the, that kind of line, you're a lucky man. And it seems like there's just dozens of people related to wrestling that you're regularly in touch with. So is there a way to kind of update that slogan so it's more applicable to your life, or do you still just feel like, well, the four to five friends is it? I still think it's applicable that if you have four or five really, really good, reliable friends that are from the wrestling business, uh, you're probably fortunate. Probably fortunate. Um, and that's kind of where I am. You know, I, I, my list, my circle is tightened. It's not expanded in, in this new attitude. It's tightened because I, I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get my, I don't get, I don't want to get my heart broken again. I got no, I need, I, don't, I need my heart to heal a little bit right now there. And I don't need to be, you know, I don't need to get involved in a situation of people that are going to, that we're going to have negative experiences. It's not worth it. It's not worth it whatsoever. When you live by the motto that our tomorrows are never guaranteed, it makes you think about a lot of things. I can't do anything about what happened yesterday, but study it, memorize it if I want, learn from it. I don't know that I'm going to be here tomorrow, and neither do you or anybody else. But I can tell you that I can, what I can do about it, something about, it, and that is today. Today. So uh, that's where I started focusing on today's. My today's are a lot more important than my yesterday's. And my todays are infinitely more important as well than tomorrow. I can plan for tomorrow. I can have my game plan. I got to go do this. I got to go to the airport here. I got to, you know, check in. I got to go do TV, whatever. But, you know, I, I, that's important to have a plan. Uh, but it's it may not happen. I mean, who, who thought yesterday Norman was still kind of nor normal in the sense of people – there weren't as many people out and about, but there's stores that were open. Now there's nothing open. I think we have uh, some handful of grocery stores. That's it. You know, there's nothing else. It's a different world. Uh, yeah, I've traded my cable and my satellite didn't go out. 
it's for times like this is why I have cable and satellite. I've got I'm both. Sure. <laughs> in case something screws up, I, I can still be uh, entertained and informed and so forth. So I think the same thing applies. And for me, narrowing my circle, you know, on, a, on certain areas, certain, I have my new circle that handles my finances. I have a new circle that handles, I got a new insurance guy. Handles all my insurance. Uh, that's another circle. I've got more circles than I've had in the past, but they're still small. And they're all, they're all with very talented, skilled people who have my best interest at heart and I consider a friend. It's nice if you can go out and have a, a, a beer with your accountant or your tax guy. It's nice to be able to, because they're going to, if they have an emotional investment in me, they're going to obviously do better work for me. And that's good. I win. They win. I'm happy. They're happy. So that's kind of where we are. It's just a, it's really a common sense pro, uh, prospect. But I think my, I have more little circles, but they're all intimate. They're all manageable. And I, and I like that. So, uh, but you know, I still got my same wrestling friends. I've had basically, you know, stone cold, by the top of the list, you know, uh, and I have a lot of guys that work for me over the years. That I get texts all night, JR, how you feeling? I, my wife, Jan, it's the three year anniversary of her death was just a few days ago. I got lots of feedback from the, from a lot of men and women in the wrestling business about that text messages, DMS, all that good stuff. So uh, that's kind of where that is. I don't know if I've answered that question enough for you, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. If, if there's something else I can give you, I will. If we go down the list of credits and things you've done, you've, of course, been in movies. Of course, Man on the Moon is one of them. But is there anything that you haven't done in your career that health permitting and time permitting you still hope to do? Uh, for example, would we ever see a Jim Ross album? Because you are a music guy. No, <laughs> I'm not approaching by that. I'm not that vain or that, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, delusional. <laughs> uh, my singing's really good in the car by myself or in the shower. That's about it. So if you said singing an album, so that would be so no album. I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. Uh, I like, uh, I'm trying to think what I, you know, I always, anytime I can get my toe back in the football water, I would probably consider it in some shape, form, or fashion. Uh, I, I'm getting my next move. It seems like we've got an interest right now in uh, voiceover work. So that distinctive Southern accent that I've been told cuts through the clutter is now being courted for voiceover roles out in L.A. that uh, my managers have been cultivating. So that might be an area. You know, I read three times for the, to be the voice of KSC. Nobody knows that. Wow. Yeah, I got, got three callbacks. Uh from the heart of the Sanders. It's heart of the Sanders. So that's right. I can do all that voice. All the same guys does the voice. He probably works. You know, he's, he's there. Does a good job. But I, I was, a, I got three callbacks to the KSC commercial to be the voice of the, the Colonel. Uh, that was when they were going through these, uh, uh, the creator was, well, they had a lot of stars, big stars, bigger than me by far, uh, that were doing, uh, voiceover work in, in costume. But then they wanted just a voiceover guy that could be what they perceived Colonel Harlan Sanders' voice to sound like. So it sent me a lot of tapes of Harlan Sanders talking. Uh, and I studied them and listened to them. And like I said, I did I did three reads for them, three different times. They sent me copy back, one and more, one and more. I just at the end of the day I didn't I didn't get the deal, but I'm in the game. So that might be kind of a fun deal. You know, I always thought that was kind of cool. I always I always thought it was neat. I saw a feature one time on the actor Sam Elliott, who's made a fortune doing voiceovers. Right. Tours, all these things. And I, I saw a story about it. He said, it's the greatest job he's ever had. He said, I wear flip-flops and shorts and a T-shirt to work. I walk in and get my script. I guess he's got to deal with his contract where he, he only will do so many words, which I think is cool as hell, because he's protecting himself by not over having to overread. He's got key words. He can enunciate those and make them really stand out. So I thought, man, what a cool gig that would be someday, to be a voiceover guy. So I, I guess with all that said, uh, I would like to be, uh, another thing that would be on my wish list would be to be the voice of a, in an animated feature. So uh, 
I'd, I'd like to do a, have a cartoon voice and uh, or a, on an animated feature might be a fun deal. So, but you know, really, uh, AEW's taking my time and my my energies, and I, you know, it's fun to be those kids who are young and enthusiastic, and you know, I got to I, I have to stop and realize, uh, Darren, that these kids grew up listening to me. I can't tell you how many times I said, Jerry, you're the voice of our childhood. I can't believe, I've had kids to me said, I can't believe you're calling my match tonight. How cool is that, man? So, uh, I'm living, I'm very blessed right now. I came out on the other side, whole and happy, but it wasn't easy, but it can be done by anybody. If that, if that's your plan and, and you really, really want to play in the game. I just, Dusty wrote to me years ago that if you give your jersey up, you're no longer on the team. If you're no longer on the team, you can't play in the game. And all of our goals, whether it be a Dusty Rhodes level star or a JR level person, uh, they want to play the game. And because I'm 68, uh, doesn't mean that I don't want to play in the game. I want to play in the game. And so that's what we're doing right now. And as long as I'm allowed to, as long as my, I can still get the job done, I'm going to continue to do so. And when folks read this book, they're going to see why. I'm in love with what I do. I'm in love with what it's meant to me. I'm in love with all the things that it has enabled me to do, including meet, marry, and love my wife. Because she, she became this major, major wrestling fan. It's awesome. And uh, so good stuff. I'm glad you read the book, Darren. I'm glad you like it. If there's any follow-ups you need from me, anything I can do for you, you got my all my contact info, so you just let me know, okay? Paltrowcast. Thanks for checking out the Paltrowcast with Darren Paltrow. It's produced by V13 Media. Theme song by Steve Schiltz. Audio mixing by Mark Pirro. Until next time, have a great Shabbos. Paltrowcast.